I know last week I uh, shared a little bit about rejoicing in the Lord. Paul said, rejoice in the Lord. I say again, rejoice. Obviously, as we always try to do is make this real uh, by trying to bring out everything, you know, what is clearly stated in Scripture, but we also have to understand sometimes in the brevity of the Scripture, the Apostle may make a statement via the Holy Spirit, you know, just the facts, <clears throat> but in light of other Scriptures, rarely where the juice comes out sometimes, and that's always what we want to do, is really focus, you know, not just read over things. So especially during times when people are going through mu so much in their lives, you know, some of this, this admonition from Scripture seems almost ludicrous. I mean, how can you rejoice going through trials? That's what we were looking at this morning in our first hour class. James says, count it all joy when you go through trials or Peter said, don't think it's strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you, but rejoice. <clears throat> that doesn't even make sense to a lot of people. How can you do that? Well, in the Lord, though, that changes everything. Being in the Lord is a place. Not a geographic one, per se. It's not like in this building or in Jerusalem, or in Mount Gerizim. You know what I'm saying, out of John 4, the woman at the well. Where, where's that place that God wants to meet us? In spirit, Jesus said, and in truth. Okay, well, you can't be in spirit unless you have the spirit. So that's what being in the Lord is all about. It means you've been born again of water and spirit. Having your sins washed away in the immersion, you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Okay. And that's according to the truth. Jesus said in John 17 and 17 that thank, sanctify them, Father. Set them apart for your holy use. Set them apart through your truth because your word is truth. And Jesus said scripture can't be broken. Scripture is the truth. So, again, you've got to add all the scriptures up. It doesn't restate everything over and over and over again in the same spot to make a point. There's an idea here that as you grow, you learn. There's a certain amount of understanding you glean along the way in your journey. In 1 Peter 2 and 2, he said, Well, now as newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow. Okay, so if you've been doing that all along... You begin to have an understanding, and it doesn't take too much along the way for God to give that increase, opening the eyes of your understanding to all these wonderful things that we've been learning. So, I want to run down. I was reading out of 1 Peter the other morning. I thought, you know what? There's a lot in here. But I want to just kind of run down through this a little bit, bringing out maybe some of the things a body might read over. And we see right, I'm going to read like in 1 Peter chapter 1, starting right out to the pilgrims. That means the sojourners and the temporary residents of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Elect. Elect according to the foreknowledge of God. Now let me just pause right there. Peter knows what he's talking about. He's talking to a people just like uh, James chapter 1 when James says to the James a bond servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the who the 12 tribes scattered abroad greetings. Well, if, who's the 12 tribes scattered abroad? Well, that's a description of Israel. Now is he talking physical Israel? Or the true Israel of God, Paul said, the spiritual Israel. Obviously, he's talking to the spiritual Israel. Remember what Paul said, or a Hebrew writer said, you haven't come to a mountain that could be touched and burned with fire and blackness and darkness and tempest. You've come to Mount Zion. You've come to the Mount Zion, the heavenly Jerusalem. 
There's a big difference between the heavenly Jerusalem and the Jerusalem, as Paul said, that now is. The one that now is is over in the Middle East, over there. Who don't believe in Jesus, by the way? So he wouldn't be writing them a letter now, would he? <clears throat> That's telling you right there in James chapter 1, right in that first verse. The context is the true Israel of God, and they are the ones scattered because the Great Commission says, Go gather them, go ye, into all the world, preach the good news to everybody. Bring them in from the east and the west and the north and the south to sit down in the kingdom of heaven with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob where the children of the kingdom will be thrust out into outer darkness, Jesus said, where there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. What? Well, who's the children of the kingdom thrust out into the outer darkness? Jesus tells you it's the Jews. The physical ones that do not accept him. He said, where I'm going, he told the Jews, you ain't coming. You'll die in your sin. Well, what happens when you die in your sin? Well, you go into outer darkness where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. So when Peter writes to the pilgrims of the dispersion, the sojourners, the temporary residents, he's talking about us. Why? Because we'll be in the world, Jesus said, but you will not be of it. This is what's going to make you a foreigner, a stranger, a sojourner. I'll remind you in chapter 11 of Hebrews, many call the faith chapter. Because it tells you that by faith, by faith, by faith, by faith, by faith, everyone all the way down from Abel... And all the way up until the, the Law of Moses time frame, all those people described, patriarchs and people under the Law of Moses, that means everybody before Jesus, described those of faith. You know, a lot of times people don't think of the Old Testament as being faith-based. Well, technically, it was law-based under specifically the law of Moses. But the promise to Abraham was for all the world. In you, Abraham, I will bless all the families of the earth. Now, he don't mean the individual families, but he just means all the people from every nation. In other words, from the east and the west and the north and the south. The Russians, the Chinese, the Africans, the Americans, when they finally show up. Why do I say that? Yeah, this may be our birthday or remembering our Independence Day. We might think that's something. Man, we are, a, we are so fresh on the global scene and as a, <laughs> compared to the history of humankind. I mean, what? To, this is 2022? You know, that means like 2022 after Christ? That's a long time, 2,000 years. That, there's a lot of history that took place in the last 2,000 years since Jesus showed up. By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out of the place, he would receive his inheritance. He went out, not knowing where he was going, dwelt in the land of promise as a foreign country, dwelt in tents for a reason, uh, Isaac and Jacob. Why? Because they were temporary sojourners. In the land that he would receive as a promise. Abraham waited for the city, verse 10, Hebrews 10, or 11, 10, which has foundation, whose builder and maker is God. Abraham was looking for a city that was heavenly, not dirt in the Middle East. I don't know how many out there and profess Christendom have all this applied physically. They think the dirt in the Middle East is all the great blessing and promise to Abraham and his descendants. Funny that Abraham wasn't looking for dirt. He knew, yeah, he was sojourning. In a, why he sojourned in a tent? Because he was a temporary resident. It was not the inheritance for Abraham. Because Abraham was looking for a city which has foundation, whose builder and maker is God. All these died in faith, 
Verse 13 says, having uh, not receiving the promise, but having seen him afar off, prophetically, and scripture can't be broken, so it's as, as real as if, you know, actual, but seeing him afar off, were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed that they were what? Strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For those who say such things declare plainly, plainly that they seek a homeland. And if truly they had called to mind that country from which they come out, had come out of, they would have had opportunity to return. But no, they desire a better, that is a heavenly country. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. The city with foundation is builder and maker is God. It is so clearly evident in the New Testament. The faithful greats are not looking for their home here, including right now. Elect according to the foreknowledge of God, the Father, and sanctification setting apart by the Spirit for the obedience and the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus. That's just the intro to Peter's epistle. The, you know, the fisherman. The common guy. Remember him, Peter? Brother Andrew? Where did he get this insight from? Mm -hmm. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. He's talking about your born againness. You have to be born. That, the elect are the chosen from every nation under heaven, called out of the darkness and into the marvelous light by what? The gospel. By the gospel. Called. You hear this message of this good news preached, and you, it, you know what? Then it requires then that you make a decision. Like that's, that's a good thing. You're not forced into this thing. Nobody is. You come of your own free will. To an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, doesn't fade away, reserved in heaven for you. Sound like uh, I go to prepare a place for you and I will receive you again to myself. That's what Jesus said. Who are kept, we the elect, kept by the power of God through faith. For salvation, ready to be revealed at the last time. I like the kept by the power of God part, because, you know, God can do anything. But when he says through faith, ooh, <laughs> that's kind of like the weak link in the chain. Why? Because faith is our part. Remember when he says, I, you know, it's my favorite verse, so you know I'm going to quote it. Romans 15, 13. And may the God of hope fill you with all joy, all peace in believing, that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Again, the operative word there, in believing. Whose part's that? Our part. I know I've said before, there's a reason they don't put screen doors in submarines. Becomes the weak link, right? The weak spot. That sub has got to be able to take unbelievable pressure from the water way down under there, crush, crush like grape, you know, uh, some of that. You can't go but only so deep in them things because it will crush even a powerful submarine. Well, I'd imagine a screen door would last in a submarine not very long. Kept by the power of God through faith. <clears throat> right. Faith comes by hearing. And hearing by the word of God. There is one faith, one Lord, one faith, one immersion. One God and Father of all, in all, through all. One, 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 one. Jesus had a little bit of faith. Move mountains. Move a mountain. Oh, ye of little faith, he said to who? The apostles. They wake him up, they're scared, the ship, you know, the storm, Jesus sleeping. Master, wake up, don't you care we're perishing? 
Jesus has to wake up. <clears throat> Why are you fearful? Oh, ye of little faith. These are experienced fishermen. Don't you think they know when it's time to get worried? When that storm hit, don't you think they know this ain't good? And the waves are coming over the ship. Yeah. Why are you fearful? You know, I don't ever see Jesus rebuking somebody. You know, sometimes we may rebuke some kid or do something. You know, we're flawed in that sense. Maybe we don't have all the information. But, you know, Jesus generally, uh, I think you would agree, knew what he was talking about. If he's accusing them of a lack of little faith, that means they should know something by now. now obviously, they're not absorbing that yet. Have you no faith, we see him say, where is your faith? So you see the faith thing, when you see it in Bible, it's either, woman, great is thy faith. The Gentile woman who wanted Jesus to cast the demon out of her daughter, but he wouldn't answer. He just ignored her, and the apostles said, Lord, send her away. She's driving us crazy. He told the woman, look, I'm only sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. It wouldn't be right for me to give the children's bread to the little dogs. She said, truth, Lord, but even the little dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the table. And he said, woman, great is your faith. And because you have believed, so be it unto you. Daughter was healed. Couldn't resist. Rewarding great faith. Kept by the power of God through faith. It culminates in salvation. He has begotten us into this living hope. But when we've been born again, that's a beginning. I know we really, really rejoice and we're very happy when people make the decision to be immersed into Christ for the forgiveness of their sins. But that's really just the beginning of a long journey with a lot of challenges and trials along the way. It's just the way it is. Now in this he says you greatly rejoice. Greatly. Though now, for a little while, if need be, you've been grieved with various trials. Oh, oh yeah, the trial part. Can't we just avoid that? Can I just get the reward? Can't we just go to heaven? No. It's necessary. Why? The genuineness of your faith being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it's tested by fire, may be found. And the praise, honor, and glory of the revelation of Jesus Christ. The genuineness of the faith must be tested to see if it's the real deal. That's just the way it is. Hey, look, we get tested in everything, right? Go send kids to school. They learn some stuff. And then the teacher says, put away your pencils or your paper, your books. Test time. Uh-oh, test time. They want to see what you learn. Teacher got to know, right? Because if the teacher sees that there's really some gaps or half the kids fail, whoo, are these just dumb kids? Or maybe the teacher didn't get the information communicated, you know. The, the whole idea is learning. So, you got to put it through again, maybe. How many times the gold goes through the fire? Seven times, Jim. Seven times. So, testing reveals the quality of the faith. And you want that tested. Here's the bottom line. Do you think God knows how you're doing in this journey? Yes. He knows exactly how you're doing. But you may think you know how you're doing. I think I'm doing pretty good. You do, do you? Well, then here comes the old trial. <clears throat> I like how Peter in the garden, <clears throat> after, or, you know, Jesus... Uh, was going to be taken and previous to that he told them that was going to happen that night and Peter said we ain't going to let this happen to you Lord you know we're ready to go to prison with you even death I said they all said that 
He said, really? He said, Peter, before this night is over, before the cock crow, you're going to even deny three times you even know who I am. No way, no way. And the other said the same thing. Yeah, Lord, we're ready. Well, they struck the shepherd, according to the prophecy, and the sheep scattered. And when Peter, who followed along to see where they took him, and when he stood there watching, and after he then he denied the Lord, when he realized what he did, it says he went out and he wept bitterly. Because the realization of where he really was at and who he really was, man, that was hard to take. And maybe you've experienced that too. You know, I know I have probably through the years at different times thinking I was further along than what I was. And boy, you can get wop, man, and you realize, well, didn't do so good with that. And so you have to go back and look at it again. God knows where you're at, but he needs you to know. We need to know where we're at. So the trial reveals it. The trial reveals it, just like all those athletes that go out and they say, ready, go, you know, in the training, you know, and they, they run against the time, you know. And they come in, how did I do, how did I do? Well, you were, you know, still not where you wanted to be. So what do you do, cry about it, moan and groan about it, quit? Or you set your mind and you do it again, you do it again. Not trying harder, but believing more. Dig. Dig down into the scripture. Learn more. Get the picture. It'll lift you right up. It'll lift you right up above the circumstance. To see yourself now. In your new potential in Christ Jesus. More than a conqueror. That your faith may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ, whom you haven't seen, but you love. Though not now you, you don't see him, yet believing, you rejoice with a joy inexpressible and full of glory. I don't know about you, but that, that's a hard one, was a hard one for me. Haven't seen him. But man, you love him. You love him with a joy that you just cannot express. I can't even imagine loving anything, even things I've seen be to that extent. Yet he claims that I can love Jesus who I've never seen. Yet believe him because I'm seeing him by faith. Faith is a picture. Faith is more real than this here podium. A true faith that moves mountains. This is not the reality. Paul said the things that are seen are not eternal. The things that are not seen are eternal. He said we don't walk by sight, we walk by faith. I mean, I won't go back there, but you guys know in chapter 12, I think I quoted it, of Hebrews chapter 12, when he said, you haven't come to the mountain that could be burned, but that, that could be touched, burned with fire, blackness, darkness, and tempest, and even Moses was a shaking and a quaking. That was very physical, and man, what a sight that must have been. He said, no, but you've come to Mount Zion, like starting in verse 22. The city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, you know, the spirits of just, made per just men made perfect, innumerable company of angels, all that. That's by faith. That's a real place. That's a real condition, a real place to be. We can, this book is designed by God, the author, to put as he does his information to produce the faith in such a way, presenting it, bringing it to us on the carrier of words, him being the author, you being the recipient, the reader, who are then taking in this information, assimilating the information, and getting the big picture so powerful 
that you can see the length and the depth and the height and the breadth. You know, I think we've sing the song or referred to it before, you know, uh, turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and then the things of earth will become strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. We're made for this. This is what will happen. He said, if you behold with an unveiled face as in a mirror, and you behold the glory of the Lord, 2 Corinthians 3.18, Paul said you'll be transformed into what? Same image. Same image. From glory to glory by what? Spirit of the Lord. What was the context of that quote out of 2 Corinthians 3.18? Exodus 33. Exodus 34, Moses cleft of the rock. God puts him there, covers him with the hand, moves the hand, passes by. All his goodness, all his, all his glory is his goodness, the mercy, his graciousness, his forgiveness, his loving kindness. All these attributes, including his justice, all passed before Moses. Powerful mind. In a vision, moment of time, Moses hit the deck. Collapsed, worshipped, got up. Headed down the hill, <clears throat> headed down the mountain. Children of Israel saw him coming, and it was like, whoa, what happened to his face? <clears throat> Says his face was shining like the sun. Can you go out here and look at the sun? Imagine that on somebody's shoulders. <laughs> Me smoking your eyeballs, man. Whew. You know, they say, don't be looking at that. Don't look at that. You'll be blind. That's pretty bright. You haven't seen him, but yet you believe and you rejoice with a joy that you cannot even express in full of glory. Boy, you're seeing something if that's, if that's what's taking place. And receiving then the end of your faith, what you see and believe that you achieve, the salvation of your soul. You know, that's kind of bringing out the temporal nature of this whole journey here. It was already brought out. Somebody was bringing it out. Your life is but a vapor. appears for a little while. James says it vanishes away. David said our lives, a man's life, is like a shadow, a hand breadth. Uh, it's very, very temporary. Then it says that uh, then from that is appointed unto men once to die. And then we appear before the judgment seat of Christ to receive for the deeds on the body. It's, it's test day. It's the final exam. <clears throat> Then you receive for the deeds on the body, good or bad. Now this salvation, it says in verse 10, the prophets have inquired and searched carefully who prophesied the grace that would come to you. You know, the prophets, uh, interesting, have been prophesying about this. I'm just turning to Acts chapter 3. All this stuff that we talk about and encourage each other, anytime you're in the scripture... Everything since Genesis 1-3, let there be light. You guys know that that light is not the light of day and night. God divided that light, you know, he called the night uh, or the darkness night and the, and the light day. Evening, morning, day one. The sun and moon and stars that create the physical light of this planet, this world, illuminating the planet, was on day four. That was day four. Well, what in the heck was in the light of, of the uh, Genesis 1-3, let there be light? Well, the Holy Spirit explains it. He says, for it is the God who commanded the light to shine out of the darkness. That's the let there be light. That's Genesis 1-3. Has shown where? In our hearts. To do what? To give the light of the knowledge. The knowledge of what? The glory of God. Where? In the face of Jesus Christ. That's, that's all the way back, and the earth was for, uh, dark and without form. Let there be light. This is what it's all about. Not yet. It wasn't going to come till the fullness of time, not until Christ came into the world. So in Acts 3, speaking of Jesus, Acts 3 and 21 well, 20, that he may send Jesus, who has preached you before, whom heaven must receive until the time of the restoration of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since when? Since the world began. 
Since the world began, or since time began, you might have a cross-reference. Other places say through before time. Come on, time, before time, that's before the Garden of Eden. You, you start to see how, how purposeful God is. For Moses truly said to the fathers, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet. That's Deuteronomy 18, verse 15 and 18. Moses knew. He knew in part, prophesied in part. Moses said, the Lord your God will raise up you a prophet like me from your brother and him you shall hear in all things whatever he says to you. And it shall be that every soul who will not hear that prophet will be utterly destroyed amongst the people. Woo! You know, it does say Jesus is coming back, right? What? In 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, in flaming fire to do what? And flaming fire taking vengeance on all those who do not know God. That's a huge swath of the human race. And all those who don't obey him. Well, that just about takes, the rest, takes, takes care of the rest. Flaming fire taking vengeance on all them that don't know him and those that don't obey him. That claim to know him, that'd be them that claim to know him, but they don't obey. They don't obey and what, who, who said that? Moses. Who's quoting it now? The Apostle Peter. And what does he say in verse 24? Yes. And all the prophets from Samuel and those who follow, as many have spoken, have foretold these days. And I'll just give you what Zechariah's dad said. Luke 1. That John the Baptist, what did I say? Luke wants Zechariah, John the Baptist's dad, said, full of the Holy Spirit. But did I just mess it up again? I get going and I don't hear what I'm saying. Let's turn to Luke <laughs> and see what Zechariah, who is John the Baptist's dad, prophesied. First off, he was full of the Holy Spirit. In Luke 1, 67, now the, his father, John the Baptist's father, was filled with the Holy Spirit, and he prophesied, saying, Blessed is the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people. He has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, just as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets who have been since the world began. Do you realize that all that in the Bible, Old and New Testament, is ultimately was pointing, pointing, pointing to the fullness of time when Christ would come? It all was, that's what it was about. And that's what we, I completely closed my Bible. Uh, that's what Peter was saying. He, Peter said, that's what the prophets was talking about. I'm right back there in 1 Peter chapter 1. Receiving the end of your salvation, or the end of your faith, the salvation of your soul. Of this salvation is what the prophets have inquired, searched carefully. They're pro they were prophesying the grace that would come to you. The you in the context is Christian. Christian. Searching. What or what manner of time? The spirit of Christ was in there? Jesus was in the prophets of old? Yep. Yes. How about that? Jesus is all over the Bible. Old Testament, obviously. And now with us in the New Testament, I like, I think Brother Jay says, the red letter edition is Christ speaking on earth. The black letter edition is Christ speaking from heaven. See that you don't refuse him, the Hebrew writer says, he who speaks from heaven. He's still speaking. Paul makes it clear, these words aren't mine. I didn't, I received this by revelation. I wasn't taught this. Revelation of Jesus Christ. 
Christ is the Spirit. Now, I do know right there it tells you that uh, Peter describes, knowing this first, in uh, 2 Peter chapter 1 and 20, know this first, that no prophecy is of any private interpretation or origin, for prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by what? Holy Spirit. Peter says in this first epistle that it was the Spirit of Christ. Holy Spirit. That was in them. How about that? And it was revealed to them that it, was, it wasn't about them. They knew that. They knew it wasn't about them. But it was us. It was Christian. That they were ministering the things which have now been reported to you, Peter says, to those who preach the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit, sent from heaven things in which the angels does. The angels wanted to know, too. Can you imagine that? The angelic realm. You know, when you look in Ephesians chapter 3, I already kind of mentioned what Paul said he received this uh, by revelation. Verse 3, Ephesians 3 and 3. How that by revelation he made known to me the mystery, as I've briefly written already, which means that's why we're reading it. It's written. It's wrote down. John says the same thing. Now, when you read, when you read, that's how God chose to do it. So we got it in our hands, tangible. You can reread it again. Hey, we got tapes now, too. And we got CDs. And, you, go, you know, we got technology now, man. Hey, video, too, if you want to see what people look like. Wouldn't that have been something if we had video from back then? Oh, wow. Now, when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known. To the sons of men wasn't made known to the angels either because we see that this is what they wanted to know which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men as it's now now it's been revealed by the spirit to who the whole apostle holy apostles and prophets verse 9 want to make all to all see what is the fellowship of this mystery which from the beginning of ages has been hidden in God, who created all things through Jesus Christ to detent that now. Now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to who? To the principalities and the powers in the heavenly places. They know now through who? The church. Through us. According to the eternal purpose which he accomplished, God, in Christ Jesus our Lord. You know, this is about judgment on the angelic realm. I guess they would have a vested interest in knowing what's happening. Well, they see now. Paul said, don't you know the world will be judged by you? Don't you know? He said, you'll judge angels. Judge angels? You see, there's a lot more going on than most people even have any idea. Gird up, therefore, then. The loins of your mind. Be sober now. Rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not conform yourself in the former lust in your ignorance. But as he who called you is holy, you are to be holy in all your conduct. Why? Because it's written, be holy, for I am holy. He also said, be pure. How pure? Be as he, pure as he is pure. And to be righteous. Well, how righteous? As he is righteous. And be perfect, Jesus said. How perfect? As perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. All the standard for our conduct now is to be conformed to his image, his character. That's not Steve making that comparison. That's what the scripture says. Those whom he foreknew, he predestined that they would be what? Conform to the image, the character of his son. That he, Jesus, would be the firstborn of many. Just like him, according to the law of the harvest. Everything bringing forth after its own kind. Boy, if that don't begin to blow your mind. Gird up the loins of your mind. Now, when you compare that to Ephesians chapter 6 in the armor of God, one of the first things he tells you in putting on the armor of God, first off, we have to take the whole armor of God in order to stand against the evil day. He says, you ain't fighting flesh and blood, okay? You're fighting against the, the schemes of the devil, 
uh, principalities, powers, and the rulers of the darkness. You ain't fighting Chinese. You ain't fighting Russians or what and nobody else. Is the battle real? Oh, you betcha. It's real. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, verse 13 says. Now, notice the first thing he tells you to do. Stand, therefore, girding your waist with truth. What did Peter call it? Gird up the loins of your mind. When I looked that up, loins, procreative power in humans. You refer to the loins. That's where your procreative power exists for making new life, right? Okay, don't need a sex education class here to get that straight. Well, but he said your mind, the loins of your mind, telling us that our mind is where the procreative power is located to bring forth the new creation where it takes place to bring forth the new creation for the transformation renewing, renewing of the mind we are begotten and conformed born again into the likeness let us make man in our image God said that's the Genesis 126 and 27 but the Apostle Paul makes it clear, just as he chose us in him, Ephesians 4, or 1, 4, just as he chose us in him uh, before, what? The foundation of the world, that what? We should be holy and without blame before him in love. The only way a human being can be holy without blame before God in love is not in the flesh. The Bible says no one in the flesh can please God. Those in the flesh can't please God, Romans 8, Paul said, verse 8 and 9. But he said to the Christian, you're not in the flesh, you in the spirit. If indeed the spirit of God dwell in you, but if anyone don't have spirit of God or Christ in him, he ain't his. Because what? You can't be conformed to the image of the Son of God by your own power. Moses didn't transform his own face. That happened to him when he beheld the glory of the Lord. We read it, or quote it. 2 Corinthians 3.18, if you behold as in the mirror with an unveiled face the glory of the Lord, you'll be what? Transformed into what? Same image. Same image, that's what this is designed to do. This is what my faith is all about. This is, produces that faith. Transformation, renewing of the mind, no longer conformed to this world. Put off concerning your former conduct, your old man. Be renewed in the spirit of your mind that you may, what, put on the new man, created by God in what? True righteousness and holiness. That your power? No way, Jose. No way, Hosea. I'm going to have to stop it there. Procreate the renewing of the mind. I've I given this before. You know, this is kind of funny. I'll close with this, but it's kind of, you know, when I think of Job... You know, it's around Job 23 where Job says, Boy, I'd sure like to talk about this, Lord. I even have a top title thingy. Lo Job longs to speak with God. <laughs> Was he want? God, let's, can we talk about this? You know, not sure what's going on, but it'd be great to chat, you know, for a little bit. Uh, Today my complaint is bitter, my hand is listless because of my groan. Oh, that I knew where I might find him, that I might come to his seat. Oh, I'd present my case to him. I'd fill my mouth with, mouth with arguments. Uh, you know, I'd like to talk about this, you know, if I could, God. So I like there at the end of the book of Job when he says here, I'm in Job 39, uh, Job 38. The Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind. Who is this who darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Now prepare yourself like a man. I will question you, and you will answer me. You might have a cross-reference to prepare yourself like a man. It says, gird up your loins. What Peter say? Gird up the loins of your mind. This is going to get deep. This is going to get powerful. Remember what Jesus said in John 16 and 12? Told the apostles at the end of his life, I have yet many things to say to you, but you can't bear it now. 
But when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he'll guide you. Into, he, he said, you ain't got the capacity for what I've got to share with you. We're going to have to expand your capacity. Gird up your loins of your mind. If you're going to bring forth this new creation, God's going to have to open your, your little pea brain. He's going to have to expand our understanding to receive it. So God told Job, you want to talk? Well, you better gird up the loins of your mind. I'll ask you a few questions. Let's see how you do. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Surely you know. Uh, who stretched out the line upon it? And to what were its foundations fastened? Or who laid its cornerstone? Job is like, Zoop. Ooh, what was I thinking? I'm just dust. The Lord answered Job. I'm looking in chapter 42. Oh, whoops. Uh, same thing. Job answered, I know you can do anything, and no purpose of yours can be withheld from you. You ask, who is this who hides counsel without knowledge? What was I thinking? I uttered what I didn't understand. So God said to Job, gird up your loins, let's talk. Actually, that was in chapter 40. Uh, Job answered the Lord, Behold, I'm vile. What shall I answer you? Verse 6, Job 40 and 6, The Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind. Now prepare yourself like a man. I will question you. You will answer me. Do you realize when you read all those chapters of the little dialogue back and forth with the Lord and Job, Job wasn't able to answer God one question. <laughs> he couldn't answer one question. Things too wonderful for him. This by faith that we've come to, where we see now, as Peter describes, all this that we have access to, all that we have access to as the elect, uh, a living hope, an inheritance that doesn't fade away, that's kept by the power of God for us. Even though we have to be tested, we're going to have to go through some trials, because it's right and reasonable that the genuineness of our faith would be tested. And this is what the Bible's been about. This is God's eternal purpose and all the prophets since the foundation of the world been talking about it. Man, when you see how purposeful God is in all these things and how great our hope is, what can we do but rejoice? Rejoice. So thank you for your attention this morning. God bless you.